Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Fong. I helped start the Zoogla community back in 2015. We now have over 28,000 members and over 300 events a year organized by volunteers. Any of you who are Zooglers or Googlers are welcome to help us uh, make sure we continue the spirit of the Google community and be googly after we all have left Google. I'm so thrilled that uh, Jonathan Francis has suggested and made the introduction to me to Dan Cobley and who we're going to hear from today. Um, He's an amazing background from running uh, marketing UK Ireland Benelux to actually leading the entire business in the UK and Ireland. Um, he was there from 2006 to 2014. We're not only going to hear about his career at Google, before Google, but even after Google, how he's been advising startups, making investments, and just um, educating all of us here, whether online and live or perhaps also in this recording. So, Dan, thank you again for taking uh, some time to join us today and um, helping all of us advance our own careers by joining the Zuga community. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. And uh, thank you for everything you do for the uh, folks that used to be at Google. I've been to a number of the events in London and uh, always bump into some people that I know and uh, great to make those reconnections. So I uh, really appreciate everything that you and all the rest of your colleagues do. Uh, thank you again. Um, why don't we get started about how you and actually ended up uh, at Google? Can you share a little bit from your early career and the steps you took to end up there? Okay, so um, it isn't going to be a presentation, but there's one slide I put together just as a kind of uh, uh, a memoir and uh, illustration of my career. So why don't you stick that one up as I speak? Um, so uh, for folks in the UK, you might recognize top left is Brighton. That's where I grew up. I grew up in uh, a kind of reasonably ordinary family uh, through four of us kids, um, uh, you know, good loving parents, but not particularly wealthy. You know, the four of us shared a bedroom until I was about seven uh, and um, uh, spent most of my time kind of kicking around on the seafront. Uh, my most early entrepreneurial venture was collecting the empty Coke bottles from the bins on the seafront after a warm weekend and taking them back to the uh, corner stops for corner stores for the uh, deposit money and made quite a lot of money for an eight, eight year old at that stage. Uh, I studied um, at a ordinary state school, um, but did very well in my exams. I always found I was quite good at figuring out kind of the mark schemes of how these things work and doing well in exams and managed to get a place at Oxford where I studied physics and uh, enjoyed the, the kind of rigor of the intellectual process of understanding things from first principles, which I think is something I've carried through my career, uh, but didn't want to be an academic or stay in that world. So actually my main motivation when I left uh, Oxford was to go traveling for a year. And so the job I applied for was the one that would give me the longest deferment between giving me a job offer and me having to start, which was an oil company called Slumberjay. And so I never really intended to join them. I've just intended to get the job offer and then uh, take the offer to the bank to get the funds to do the traveling and then come back and figure out what I actually wanted to do when I when I got back. Uh, but um, had such a good time traveling around the world for nine months that I never really thought about work again until I got home and I was due to start work the next week. So uh, I went up to London, picked up my visas and went out to Egypt and Pakistan to be an oil exploration engineer with a business called Slumberjay, which I did for a couple of years. Um, lots of really interesting early responsibility. So as a 23 year old, I had a million dollar truck and a team of seven people and was in charge of a, of a well site uh, for periods of time. But I also learned something quite valuable there, I think, which was that uh, the people in that industry, at least the ones that I worked with, were very much motivated by the money, but not very interested in the work. And they ended up getting somewhat trapped into a lifestyle of being quite well paid, being expatriates and not paying tax and having lots of their living expenses covered. So there was a bit of a handcuff and they were found it very difficult to leave. And so most people... Uh, that I worked with and almost everybody senior to me was resentful of the lifestyle they got locked into and so uh, taught me pretty early on that if there are not people senior to you in the place that you work that you aspire to be like and enjoy doing what they're doing then it's time to get out and so after a couple of years I uh, left Saint-Roger, came back, uh, went back into studies and did a one-year master's at Cambridge at the, in the part of the engineering department, but uh, 
a master's in manufacturing management, which was a kind of hybrid between a manufacturing engineering uh, master's and an MBA. So I did that for a year. Uh, it involved lots of really interesting project work where we would go out and spend kind of two to six weeks being um, uh, unpaid, incompetent McKinsey equivalents for little companies that couldn't afford the real thing. And uh, we really, really enjoyed that process, enjoyed the very rapid uh, learning and the switching of contexts and um, uh, kind of constantly being exposed to new industries and businesses. So when I graduated from that, consulting seemed like the obvious extension of what I'd enjoyed there. And so I joined a business called Monitor Company that some of the older folks on the call might know. It's now part of Deloitte, but it was a, a kind of smaller challenger to McKinsey and uh, BCG back in the day. And it was founded by a guy called Michael Porter. And I can just uh, found this old picture of Michael Porter's three books being put to the only uh, good use that uh, I could think of, uh, which is keeping an old hunchback monitor uh, at eye level. Uh, did that for a few years, um, enjoyed the variety again of those projects and was very inspired by the leader of the London practice, a guy called John Wells, who was uh, a brilliant uh, teacher and coach and, and mentor. And he left to go and set up an internal strategy department at Frito-Lay International, which owns Walker's Crisp in the UK and their equivalents around the world. And so I followed him there to uh, become part of the new internal strategy function. And the initial or the, the main project that we were all working on there was to how to turn the portfolio of businesses in the snacks division that Pepsi had acquired into a more coherent company. So it had acquired Walkers in the UK and Matatano in Spain and Tasty Foods in Egypt and all these other uh, previous national champions and was running them very independently. And so the opportunity was to uh, look at the manufacturing and operations and figure out how do you streamline them to get the benefits of scale. And so uh, my initial job, I was kind of head of harmonization, which was getting all of the different countries to uh, consume product from a single factory that would distribute across Europe. And what was really interesting there, I found, is that uh, the biggest barrier to being operationally efficient was that the marketing people all had this bizarre idea that their consumers were so uniquely different that a 270 millimeter pack size from Spain wouldn't possibly sell in France where they were used to have 260 millimeter pack size or that tasty cheese Doritos in one country couldn't be sold as tangy cheese somewhere else. And so uh, I ended up going on this massive harmonization effort, which was um, initially trying to get factory and purchasing and logistics efficiencies, but ended up actually being a marketing transformation program to try and get alignment between these different countries. And I think if I look back on everything I've done in my whole career, probably the most uh, satisfying in terms of the outcome I got versus the expectations was going to all of the Eastern European countries uh, and you know, let's not forget this was quite a long time ago and there was a lot of mistrust between kind of Russia and Poland and the Baltic states and so on and getting them all to harmonize on a single pack design and putting each other's languages on the back of the packet uh, to get massive cost efficiencies and we had managed to get that through through a bunch of kind of you know, teamwork and negotiations uh, and some very creative uh, exploration of the rule book so in russia at the time there was a rule that said that this uh logo that had to go on the back of the pack that described something to do with uh the way recycling was done um it, it had to be on the front and there was no way that there was all the other countries were going to accept this logo that was very russian on the front of the pack so we determined what else needed to be on the front it also had to have the uh, the grammage um, and the brand name and a few other things. So we put those all on the back along with this uh, required logo and we defined it as the front. And we just convinced all the authorities that everybody just merchandised their packets at the, the wrong way around. Uh, and, and that was just legally allowed. So, you know, some, some, some quite fun stuff there. 
But anyway, I, I did that for uh, about five years at Walker's, gradually going into a more mainstream marketing role through that transition, ended up running uh, the Doritos brand in, uh, in the UK um, and moving from the PepsiCo kind of central European operations into a core UK role. Uh, and then coming into the year 2000, uh, it was obvious that the internet was becoming a very exciting thing. Um, I was, you know, keen on reading about it every week in the magazines that came out and so on. And I tried to persuade the folks at Walkers that they should uh, get involved in this. But um, the conventional wisdom at the time was that nobody was ever going to uh, market uh, fast moving consumer goods or sell food products online. So it was a waste of everyone's time. Um, and so I quit and joined a little startup called Home Pro, which was a very early incarnation of a matching service between homeowners and trades professionals, builders, electricians, plumbers to uh, uh, to link them via a rating and referral engine. Um, it was very early on. We completely messed up on the business model. Uh, we relied on the builders to tell us at the end of a job how much it was worth and send us a check for the um, uh, for the commission. And they were all incredibly creative. And so the lady that had asked for her loft conversion apparently only needed a light bulb changed by the time we got our commission uh, check through from them. And so we failed to make any real money and the business effectively shut down. But it was an amazing learning journey where I joined as employee number three. Uh, eight months later, we had 60 people um, and 10 months later, we were effectively bust. And so I uh, went through a you know, five year learning journey in the space of nine months, uh, ended up kind of effectively being fired as the business scaled down. And then I luckily joined Ask Jeeves, which some may remember was a precursor to Google. In fact, when I joined uh, Ask Jeeves, I think was number three in the UK for search engines and Google was number six. So uh, uh, that uh, kind of dates it a little bit. I spent six months with them in the UK, and then I spent uh, about 18 months living in uh, just outside Silicon Valley, living in Berkeley in California, uh, and working uh, for Jeeves in, in Emeryville and, uh, uh, and Oakland. And that was absolutely a fantastic period and really exciting, lots of learning. Uh, but as the dot-com bubble fully burst and 9-11 happened and so on, they shut down the uh, division that I was working in there and effectively I got laid off there and so I've been laid off by two different companies and actually three different roles because the UK role at Jeeves that I initially uh, joined laid me off so I had a period there which was quite uh, quite a lot of turmoil so leaving a very safe role at Walkers uh, and Pepsi and joining a startup which went bust and then joining two divisions of Jeeves that effectively went bust and so within Three years I'd been fired three times and uh, uh, you know, wasn't quite sure where my career was going. But um, I came back to the UK and joined Capital One, which was, I think, to many intents and purposes, the first fintech. So it was a challenger business that had grown up uh, by using data and technology differently to the other banks and was the first organization to really do any kind of uh, credit history based underwriting with differential pricing. And so before Capital One, there were only two outcomes to a credit card application. It was uh, a 19.9% interest rate or a rejection. And it was Capital One's innovation to say actually some people could get cards at a higher price and some at a lower price and, and so on. And so uh, I spent you know, five very interesting years there. Um, and through that period was definitely the migration from traditional uh, paper-based and direct mail acquisition and account management through to being digital online. And so we uh, explicitly lobbied for the right to allow credit agreements to be signed electronically. And winning that while I was there helped us migrate from sending uh, hundreds of millions of paper letters to people uh, to doing a lot of our acquisition online. So that was uh, uh, quite formative. And um, then uh, after I'd been there four or five years, I got a call from a headhunter uh, to inquire as to whether I'd be interested in talking about a role at Google. And, and it sounds like an absolute no-brainer at the moment, but back in the time, it wasn't quite so clear because I was 
at a very successful business. I was running a marketing team of 60 people uh, with a hundred million dollar budget and you know, lots of uh, kind of lots of positive uh, history there. And the role at Google was essentially to sort of kickstart the marketing activities in Europe. And so the team I joined was uh, Lorraine, who had just been hired as um, the European head of marketing. I was to come in as head of UK and Benelux. Uh, I was to inherit a team of two people in the UK and two in Benelux um, and no budget uh, to speak of. Uh, and people who were around back in that era will remember that the marketing team was essentially the kind of T-shirts and catering department for product launches. And, uh, you know, the, the role there was to figure out how to make marketing a, uh, a business driver and a profit center and so on, which, um, uh, which I'll come back to, but to kind of try to do that over the next eight years. Uh, and then I'll come on later to talk about the transition out of Google into uh, the world of, of startups and, and fintech. And then the last picture on the right is the most important one. That's uh, the rest of my life, which is my wife and my two sons who uh, both went to Imperial. Uh, one studied and has just graduated in computer science and the other uh, graduated a couple of years ago in design engineering. So um, uh, that's probably enough on how I got to Google and then I can answer some other questions uh, as we go. You can probably take awesome. the slide down now. Great background. I'll uh, stop sharing the slide now. Um... So I want to get to, before going to other submitted questions, dig in to a few things you had mentioned, uh, Dan, super interesting to me. Uh, for now, you probably have heard a lot of uh, current Googlers who are also similar to what you mentioned in your first job in golden handcuffs. As people talk to you about their own experience, what are the commitments they have, what advice do you have for them if they feel that they have such golden handcuffs? Yeah. Uh... So I think that, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and so on, you need enough money to pay the rent and to feed yourself and so on. I think beyond that, at least for me and for most people that I've got to know well, uh, additional money is really just a way of keeping track on the progress of your career rather than it being something that enables things that are essential to, to living a happy life. And so what I've always done for myself and I've encouraged other people to do is to uh, every month or so, ask yourself three questions about your career. Um, am I still learning? Am I enjoying going to work most of the time? And do I feel valued and feel I add value in the work that I do? And if you can't answer those three questions, yes, then spend a couple of months trying to fix it. Uh, and that's talking to your boss about can you go on to a new project? Can you, is there some course you can do? Um, can you stop doing something that's really painful to you? And if your current company can't fix that, then it's time to move somewhere else. Um, and I think so long as the place you're going to move to can sort of continue to cover your basic living costs, then I don't think the money or the handcuffs should be in that equation for the kind of optimal happiness of, of life outcome. And certainly when I left Google, it was a very uh, economically irrational thing to do because I had lots of uh, share options and uh, share price was doing well and so on. And I knew that, you know, uh, probabilistically weighted, any kind of startup activity was very unlikely to uh, make me more wealthy than staying at Google. But I felt like, you know, I could answer those three questions probably more positively by moving on at that stage of my career than by staying. And should people spend a few months or a year considering this? Or what time period should people start thinking about and then perhaps cut the cord if they feel that they should continue to do something else? I think you should spend uh, a few months figuring out um, whether there is an opportunity to fix the broken bit of those three questions. And it might be that you, know, you, you have an agreement with your boss that actually there's this great role coming up in six months time. It's the perfect next thing for you. Uh, um, uh, this person is going to go on maternity leave and you can fill in there or this person moving on or whatever, then I think you can then be patient because there's a, there's a kind of contract to fix it, if you like. But if you uh, just get a fob off answer, which is, you know, you know trust us, um, it'll get better and nothing's changing, then I think, you know, after uh, a quarter or two, you should seriously start looking elsewhere. 
Thank you. And similar to that, you had mentioned that you were laid off a couple of times. We know a few of uh, ex-Googlers who were laid off and uh, going through that situation right now. How did you pick yourself up or think about the situation in a more holistic standpoint? What advice do you have for any ex-Googlers who have been laid off recently? Yeah. Um, when I was quite lucky, I guess, that I had some helpful people in my network that were able to help me navigate to something new. And so uh, never underestimate the value of the network that you have and the connections that you have. And I think probably the, the greatest value I have in the role that I do today is the network that I've built up over time. And I, part of that has been because I've been in interesting places and I've made, uh, you know, been at the right place at the right time. But part of it has been a very conscious effort to nurture and maintain and build on those networks. And, you know, it's also easy to think, well, that's easy when you're you know, in a senior role and you've been around a long time, but I'm only, you know, a 25 year old in my first job. But a lot of the network that I have today is actually from people in that era that I've made an effort to keep up, up with. So I would say really invest in, in conscious actions to uh, keep the, that network going and to, to make the most of it because and, and try to help your network as much as you might need help from them in the future because that's kind of how it works. So, so that's definitely a foundational thing which will help. But then when the difficult situation comes about, uh, just figure out what it is that is going to enable you to say yes to those three questions you know in what role am I going to be able to continue learning uh, be able to enjoy what I'm doing and be able to add value uh, and then in that space you'll find things that you're going to be good at and they're going to want you uh, use your network to try and identify opportunities and just put yourself forward so the when I got laid off from home pro uh, I got the role at Ask Jeeves because the guy who was running uh, Ask Jeeves Marketing in the UK, I saw um, was a guy that I'd done a deal with when I was at Walker's and he was actually working for St. Ival, a dairy manufacturer, and we were looking to do a joint venture on some Doritos dipping uh, sauces. And so I contacted him and say, hey, I remember we, we did this joint venture. Um, I didn't ask him for a job. I said, uh, I've spent nine months in the tech space. Um, I'd love to understand a bit more about the landscape. Could I buy you lunch to learn about the tech landscape? And so we went for lunch, we chatted, and then through the conversation, it emerged that he had a project that he wanted some help on, asked me to come and do the project for three days a week for a few weeks. Um, and that allowed me to prove myself to him. And then I got the job offer. And so often it's by kind of putting yourself in front of people in a way to highlight what, what you can offer, but in an unthreatening sort of low demand ask in the way I just asked to buy him lunch uh, is, the, is the way to make those opportunities happen. That's a wonderful uh, tactical sharing of how to, how to do that. Uh, Dan, just want to make sure also get some of your thoughts of how to network authentically. I think everyone has their own way of networking. And you mentioned how important it was to, to maintain those relationships over the past a couple of decades. Any tips that you can share of how you do it authentically yourself and that people can perhaps learn from? Yeah. Um, I'll give one sort of big example and then uh, some, some smaller ones. So um, when I left Google and was going to knew I was going to go into the fintech space, uh, it was clear that people who had worked at Capital One uh, were you know, likely to be ideal kind of fintech connections um, for the reasons I talked about earlier. And I had some really good uh, memories and a few loose connections from my Capital One days, but I hadn't done a brilliant job, partly because Google had been so busy of staying in touch with them. Um, so I had a bit of time as I was kind of uh, winding down from Google. And so uh, I went onto LinkedIn and I found as many people as I could that were there in that era and said, right, let's all get together for a drink um, and kind of reminisce about the old times. Um, and I asked them to invite anybody else that they remember from that era. Uh, and it's now been eight, nine years where uh, once every six months or so, I organize a Capital One alumni meetup drinks. Um, so it's not quite the Zuba network. You know, you've got however many tens of thousands on yours and I've got 
180 or something on mine, but it's a, it's a very valuable network. And I think probably half of the top fintechs, certainly the lending fintechs in the UK have got a Capital One alumni person on the senior team. And so it's been super useful to, to leverage that network. I've hired four or five people from those meetup drinks uh, into various businesses I work with and, uh, and so on. So that's one way of doing it. Um, uh, but I think the more uh, sort of everyday way of doing it is every time I, I read something interesting or I learn about something new, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, who could that be useful to? Um, and I'll just ping it out to them through LinkedIn or through an email. Um, and that I find is a great way to keep the connections live and then to restart conversations. And they often will ping back, oh, that's interesting. I thought you might be interested in this or you might like to meet this person. And so typically that's where it starts from. And the last thing I do is um, I, ideally I would be better with a proper kind of HubSpot type CRM system. But actually I find that the uh, email reminder or sleep function is my best friend. So if I um, have an exchange with somebody and I think, you know, oh, this, I, I really enjoy speaking to this person. She's, uh, she's so helpful and so knowledgeable, but I don't have any obvious uh, reminder to stay in touch with them. Then I'll just um, sleep the email exchange and ask it to pop back in six months time. When it comes back, I'll just remind me and say, oh, uh, we should get together for a coffee. And, uh, okay. and I try and do that to keep the network alive. Wonderful suggestions given these times as well. So thank you for sharing that. And one last question from what you said in your introduction was really, uh, I, I, I want to dig in and one more, one more thing. It's you mentioned you had spent some time in Eastern Europe. If you were someone looking at potentially investing their time in such emerging markets, is there one or two countries in Eastern Europe they should really dig in or has it been fully explored and uh, fully expanded already? Or is there one or two countries you would like go to the XYZ country these days? Uh, I mean, to be fair, that Eastern European work I was doing was 15 plus years ago. So um, uh, the world has changed massively. But uh, I think there's a there's a broader question there, which is there are very often hot spots of innovation, whether that's kind of fintech in the UK or there's prop tech stuff in Australia, which is pretty strong. There's various other areas where, where if you know something is a, a leading market, then to keep an eye on that and think how might that apply to my market um you know it's the obvious the rocket internet playbook is kind of that but it doesn't have to be quite as uh overtly uh copycatty as that it could be just taken inspiration much like with ClearScore, the inspiration was credit karma but the execution was quite different and we saw in the uk that credit karma was this huge success in the US giving free credit scores and reports to people, how could we do something similar in the UK? And that was the that was you know part of the foundation of that business. Um, and I think if you have got uh, a knowledge of and connections in a less developed market in a certain space, then to leverage that along with observation of where more advanced markets are making great innovations, that's the perfect combination to start a new startup business. Thanks for those helpful insights. So let's go into a bit more about some of the submitted questions. Um, a few folks were asking about your experience um, advancing very rapidly within Google. Um, clearly there was the time when Google was expanding uh, in, in a very fast fashion. Were there some learnings that they could take if they're one, evaluating potential startups to join and two, what did you think you did so differently perhaps to everyone else that they can learn from and they should be implementing in their own career? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first point you made is the most important one. Uh, um, be in the right place at the right time. I was bloody lucky with my timing. Uh, you know, Google was um, growing really fast. It was really in, invested in uh, adding uh, the growth engine and marketing, at least conceptually, um, took a while to prove it out, but you know, that was key. And the whole kind of search and web space was, was huge. So I think a, a, a broader point that I have learned in my career, I think, is uh, if you can just immerse yourself in a space which is going to be clearly more important in the future than it is in the past, where your skills that you'll develop now are going to be relatively 
uh, short supply and high demand in the future, that's the best thing you can do. So, um, you know, I, I clearly didn't have that in PepsiCo because, you know, that's been around forever and there are plenty of uh, FMCG marketing folks around. But I left uh, Pepsi, took a role with about one third the salary and lots of uncertainty by jumping into the dot-com startup. Um, and by any rational measure, that was a stupid career move in terms of advancing my overall career and learning potential. But it was obvious to me, you know, I had enough confidence that the internet was going to be much more important in the future than it was in the past. And uh, people with internet skills would be in short supply. And so that was a career move worth making. And it was those skills and that you know that tick box how we'd worked at an internet business was one of the reasons that google made me the job offer when they did and so you know this, i think that's a that's a kind of key overall theme and then within google um i think that uh the business was looking for a way of investing in growth through marketing but in a, a way that was very true to Google's philosophies and ways of thinking. And so I think most of the marketeers that they'd spoken with were all about um, kind of fluffy marketing, if you like. You know, the, you know, if you think about marketing as a combination of spreadsheets and coloring in, and you know, most of them had been the kind of the coloring in end. And I came from the more spreadsheets end. Uh, and that kind of worked. So we had to uh, develop the credibility of marketing as an ROI driven. Uh, business engine that the engineering and product minded people could buy into. And so where we started was to say, right, the most measurable thing is the amount of revenue which is generated by new advertisers to AdWords. So if we can bring in incremental advertisers through marketing campaigns and we can demonstrate allowing for cannibalization and true incrementality, that the new money generated by these new advertisers more than pays for the cost of bringing them in, then there's pure ROI in that. Um, and it doesn't rely on any fluffy hand waving. And so that was the kind of first step in building credibility of marketing as a way to invest money to make more money. And that really hadn't been done at Google by that stage. And so, so that was the kind of the first step. And then you could go, the next step was, well, let's do the same thing in consumer. And some of you may remember back in the day, uh, the Google toolbar was a thing which enabled people to more easily search from, uh, from their uh, IE browser, which most people were using at the time. And so again, we demonstrated that if we could market to people and uh, persuade them to install the Google toolbar, they would search more, those searches would be incremental, that would generate revenue, that would more than pay for the marketing campaign and grow from there. And so each, step in the journey of building up marketing's contribution was a very clear uh, analytical ROI driven approach which all went all the way to the end of um, you know, when we were marketing Google Chrome uh, we were taking whole countries as a B split experiments and saying well let's do Switzerland versus Austria let's do uh, Norway versus Sweden will heavily market in one and not in the other, and we'll look at the incremental uptake of, uh, uh, of Google Chrome, demonstrate the revenue benefit that comes from that, pays for the big TV campaigns, and, uh, and you know, that was all still very consistent with the way the organization thinks. So, so I guess the overall lesson there is um, kind of understand the DNA of the organization that you're in, what it values, and then figure out how to bring your new skills to create something within that value set. And then that will help you kind of demonstrate your value quickly and move forward in the organization. I love those go-to-market tips. Uh, Dan, I feel like you're writing a book about go-to-market for American companies across Europe. So thanks for sharing those, those initial tips. Let's talk about your post-Google career. How did you go into venture and startups after uh, leading so many different amazing teams inside Google? Yeah. So. Um, I've been uh, five years in marketing roles, running uh, UK and Benelux, and then running the European marketing team with my colleague Yonja. Uh, and then I'd done three years running the UK commercial business. And the next 
Google roles for me that were being talked about were all in Mountain View or in back in the US and my family situation that wasn't ideal and so uh, again I reflected on what I'd enjoyed the most in my career to date and it had been the earlier stages of building things rather than the later stages of running things so I actually enjoyed building the marketing function a lot more than I'd enjoyed running the UK sales engine even though it was a kind of you know bigger job on paper it was uh, uh, it was less of the things that I'd enjoyed and so I thought okay I want to go back into uh, building something um, I'd done five years of fin with capital one and eight years of tech with google and there was this uh, amazing kind of building spree going on in the uk around fintech um i'd enjoyed the startup uh journey i've been on even though it was a crash and burn journey it was fun um and so i thought right i'd like to go into fintech uh, was the obvious next step for me and uh, i explored i explored various options i looked at uh joining a big US fintech that was trying to establish in the UK. I looked at uh, joining an established UK business, replacing the founder as a, as a CEO candidate. And then I looked at joining Blenheim Chalcott, which was this venture builder organization run by people that I'd worked with at Monitor way back, uh, who were looking at expanding into the fintech space and starting some new businesses. And in the end, I chose that route. Uh, and the first role there was to Kind of work alongside uh, the Blanche Alcott founders, uh, some folks from QED, and then Justin Bassini, who came in very early on and built out ClearScore. And so I was a kind of co founder there and then did a similar thing with Salary Finance, um, uh, all within the Blenheim group. And then gradually I started having the confidence to invest a bit of the money I was getting from selling down Google shares into. Uh, venture position, sorry, um, angel positions into new startup businesses. And I found that over time, a number of those folks asked me if I would kind of help them, uh, advise them, join the board or whatever. And so I've gradually been winding down uh, my Blenheim Chalcott involvement. And I've been uh, over the last uh, year or so fully focused on being an angel investor and an advisor to a bunch of different businesses, mostly in fintech, but there and elsewhere. Thank you for that. And were there specific parts of what you did at Google that really has helped you in your investment career? Uh, the network has certainly been helpful. So people I've met um, on, as part of my Google journey, either within Google or outside, um, clients and contacts have been very helpful. Uh, I think a lot of the um, analytical and uh, you know, numbers-based discipline that uh, I certainly picked up at, as a consultant at Capital One, but was reinforced uh, by Google has been super helpful. And I think lastly, there's, a, there's an overall belief that is probably quite subconscious for many people at Google, which is that the, uh, the, the march and the progression of technology is going to continue and whether it's, precisely Moore's law or something associated with it, the capability of technology-led um, solutions is going to get better, uh, you know, doubling every 18 months, two years or so on. And so if you can see an area where technology is starting to have an impact, then you can uh, intuit, intuit that it's going to have a, you know, a multiplier impact in the future. And so it's a place that you can jump into. I think that, that sort of concept of betting on the future and betting that the technology of uh, two years time is going to be um, two or three times uh, more capable than it is today and building a business that is aligned to that and having the mindset that uh, if I'm building something that's going to launch in 18 months, then let's think about the cost structure of what I'm launching as the future cost structure, not today's cost structure and building a business around that. I think all of that kind of mindset that uh, Google helped to reinforce has been super useful in all of the businesses I've been working with. And now as you're doing the research yourself, uh, are you subscribed to certain uh, periodicals, newsletters? Uh, how do you do the basic research yourself, speaking to different friends? Or how would you recommend someone who are trying to break in and understand those concepts themselves, execute and spend their time? 
Uh, this is a broader point, actually, to anyone anywhere in the career and something that I uh, explicitly brought in to the sales team that I was running uh, in my last three years at Google, which is how do you maintain a, a good, healthy external perspective, particularly when you're in a big company like Google, which can be quite inward looking um, and uh, danger of just kind of uh, reinforcing everything that people think they know from within the organization. So the, the, the discipline was every day, read something from outside your company, outside your injury, outside your uh, industry. So that might be um, a blog post or uh, listen to a podcast or uh, you know, re read an email newsletter, whatever. So every day, read something from outside your day job. Every week, speak to somebody from outside your day job. So every week, uh, have a coffee with an old friend from a previous company or um, uh, go for a drink with somebody you met at a conference or something like that. And then every month, go and really visit or experience something. I think one of the most uh, fun and, and, and powerful things that we did was uh, I, we had a weekly senior management team meeting. And once a month, we would ask one of the Google connections, it might have been a partner or a big customer, if we could host that meeting at their office, um, would they lend us a conference room? And we'd kind of go to the Telegraph and we'd sit just outside the newsroom, uh, or we'd go to uh, Bain Capital and sit in their uh, deal room, whatever. Uh, and we went to Ocado and looked at their um, automation uh, robots. And as part of our three hour meeting, we would ask them to come and speak to us for 45 minutes about what was exciting in their industry. And so yeah, that was a very visceral way of learning something. And it's a bit more difficult to do that if you're in a kind of um, uh, uh, a more kind of operationally intensive job at a different layer in the organization. But I think that mindset of trying to expose yourself to a bit of thinking every day, a conversation every week and a bit of an experience every month. I think is super useful for your general exposure to the outside world and the stimulus that's going to help you think. And then specifically to answer your question, um, in terms of what's going on in the industry, uh, I'm particularly interested in large language models right now and what's going on there. So my favorite read is something called Ben's Bytes, which is a, a newsletter that you guys should look at. Um, and kind of more generally, uh, I'll read um, Benedict Evans, I'll listen to the Andreessen Horowitz um, uh, podcast series and uh, a bunch of other things like that that kind of try to keep me fresh. Thank you. So while we're on that point, talking about LLMs and AI, there were some questions regarding your thoughts on the role of AI in FinTech. Would you mind expanding more about uh, your thoughts and what you've seen so far, Dan? Yeah. Uh, I think that AI and machine learning is going to be as prevalent in five years time as uh, spreadsheets and databases are today. So it's going to be something where, you know, just every company either uses them or is uh, struggling to stay in business. Uh, in the immediate term, I see a huge opportunity for kind of back office efficiency. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Everything from um, I'm completing an RFP for a big client. Um, I've got my knowledge base of standard answers. I've got their question set. Uh, I feed the two into an LLM and it will give me a 95% completed RFP response. And then I use a human to go through it. You know, that sort of efficiency is there today and is, is very, very valuable. Um, then uh, the next level is using them to look at risk signals and so on for underwriting. I think uh, we're starting to see some maturity in that space that will give people uh, advantages. Um, and then uh, the last step is putting them directly in front of customers. And that's still a little bit scary because of the hallucination issues, but uh, I think good you know, lang chain type models where you're explicitly telling the LLM to only source the answers from your in-house documentation uh, is starting to get quite reliable and good. And I think we'll get to a point quite soon where you can trust a uh, LLM based chatbot to do 95% of your customer service uh, query responses and triage or um, uh, things like that. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, huge opportunity there. 
Awesome. And, and folks, we're going to open up to uh, audience questions for the last few minutes. So feel free to start typing up your questions in the chat. A uh, couple more questions uh, before I go there, though. Uh, thank you for putting down your investments in your LinkedIn profile. Damn, people can understand who and what kind of startups you invest in. But can you talk broadly? What kind of businesses do you invest in? What you look for investment opportunities for people to want to reach out to you? Is there anything you're actively looking for right now? Yeah. Uh, I'm probably like many angel investors, I'm a little bit slower now because uh, after you've been doing angel investing for a while, you end up relying on selling some of the old ones to uh, pay for the investment in the new ones. And there's not been a lot of selling going on in the last uh, 18 months for reasons we all understand. So, um, uh, so a bit slower. But the buckets of stuff that I look to invest in are uh, probably about 50% is core fintech so uh uk and this is uh uk based fintech uk just because i like to be able to go and visit and spend time with the people that i've got to know through the investments and it just uh, logistically easier so uk based fintech uh particularly in uh sort of the uh payments and lending uh type space where i've got some experience uh and where I can kind of bring my 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 network and my uh, expertise to to try and be helpful to the business. So about fifty percent there. Then about twenty five percent is uh, investing in businesses which are run by people that I've worked with in the past. And so that means that it's much more random. So I've got an investment in a Latin American uh, digital dentistry business um, and a. Uh, Silicon Valley based business that's um, helping to automate the, the growth process, a guy called Sandeep Menon that some of you might know, so uh, just started, started that one, looks great. And so, you know, I definitely outside of the UK and outside of fintech where I'm investing behind a person that I, uh, I know well and think will do a great job. Um, and then the last bucket is I've actually been trying to seek out uh, minority founders who are kind of in and around the space that I know and can be helpful in just because I was trying to figure out rather than sitting on a charity board, how could I kind of do a little bit of something useful with uh, any spare time I've got? And I figured that uh, the investing space, the founder space, and particularly in the FinTech area is still sadly predominantly filled with, you know, privileged, uh, white male founders that have uh, uh, been given a bit of a head start in life and uh, uh, and that's not going to change until there are more role models um, and mentors and so on from other communities and so uh, I've been trying to do a bit more of that. Great thank you Dan I'll get Rich to ask this question after I'll ask this final question I have it's you've been serving also as an advisor to startups can you talk more about what startups can get from being an advisor and what makes uh, advisors useful what recommendations do you have there? I wonder if I should ask John that to answer that question since I've been advising him and he uh, might know what's been useful. I thought you might uh, deflect that one. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to pick up Dan. Um, so I think I'd start by saying uh, Dan is definitely a unicorn when it comes to advisors. We we have quite a large number of advisors as, as many startups do. Um, I think where Dan uh, could really teach a lot of other advisors kind of uh, where value can really be added um, and support can be given is uh, really deep, deep thinking between when you speak and next speak about opportunity. So always keeping an eye open and just having you in the back of back of the mind. Always looking for connections to other potential advisors, other startups, looking to create those links that otherwise you simply wouldn't be able to spot because you're you're in different literally physical spaces and and uh and digital spaces um i would also say uh reassurance to some extent that the decisions that you're making are rational being able to talk them through as well to um to explain your logic get it challenged i think all of those have been incredibly helpful and ab above all else where where i think um dan has made a really big difference for us is just the consistency just being there um always knowing that uh, we're going to have a next chat that we're going to catch up that it's almost a um barometer 
for what your progress has looked like and you've got somebody from outside the core operations who's able to give that perspective from outside but um has that full context of the journey from start to finish so i would say all of those have been extremely helpful and yeah i would i would encourage any startup that finds somebody like dan who who wants to kind of see the journey through and see a product come to fruition to really um to to make best use of of uh that kind of consistent advice so yeah that would be my my answer thanks john nothing to add to that <laughs> well, let's go to rich rich you have a good question submitted uh would you mind unmute yeah. uh yeah sure so so first of all i guess that the context um being is that um it, it, i think it's very hard for a lot of us founders who are like say building companies over the past 10 years to really uh to be able to appreciate how transformational LLMs or AI could be. And there's only really a handful of entrepreneurs here in the UK who are around during the um, dot-com period and got to work for you know, companies like Google, uh, the Ask Jeeves, et cetera. And so I think that's kind of the first context, just really trying to understand you know, how transformational things could be and also how quickly things could move as well. And I find it really fascinating reading stories of founders from that period and also speaking to the few that I do know about you know, just, just how to approach this, this opportunity. And then second, obviously, you've got great experience, um, obviously, through that dot com period, but also as a fintech investor. If you're an investor today, Dan, uh, you know, specifically focusing on AI fintech, what would you be building? Mm. It's, it's something I constantly kind of nag away at myself on is should I be looking for something to, to start myself again? But I think I've, I've got too selfish in enjoying the variety of uh, of different interactions that I have with you know, John and lots of other uh, folks to, to give that up. So I haven't addressed that question specifically, but I, um, I think that with any of these kind of new technologies, it's worth thinking about what are they likely to be capable of in two to three years time? Where and where are the rich kind of profit pools or consumer needs that are uh, addressed by organizations that are going to move incredibly slowly to take advantage of the new technology. So, you know, in very simplistic terms, you could say, you know, there was a uh, 50, oh, there was a, I don't know what it would have been, five billion pound profit pool in the yellow pages sector uh, in the late 1990s. And it was obvious that they were going to be incredibly slow and cumbersome in adopting digital technology. So if you could find a way to match uh, consumer need with local tradesperson supply uh, digitally, then it was going to make you lots of money. And essentially that was Craigslist and then it was Google. And so, you know, I think it's kind of that sort of uh, mental model is a good way to identify uh, business building opportunities. Dan, Nikita was asking this question. You may have covered it earlier, but anything else you may want to add? What do you look for when you decide to invest in an idea? Uh, there's a, it's very difficult to uh, pull apart the idea from the person or the team behind the idea. So it's definitely a combination of the two. And the earlier you're investing, the more it's about team, the later you're investing, it's more a balance of the team and the idea. Um, but for the idea, I definitely want a clear, uh, a, a, or at least a, a confidence that the founding team has a very clear idea on uh, how to build positive unit economics. So how do you build something that your market's prepared to pay significantly more than it's gonna cost you to deliver each unit? Um, how you are going to drive volume of those units. So what's your um, scalable approach to marketing and building uh, volume in that area and how you're going to fund it. And so, you know, what's the cash cycle look like? Uh, how long does it take for your marketing dollars to be returned through your unit economics and how does that business get funded? So you know, you know, most of the business that I see that fail it's not because the uh, the product is bad or that the uh, consumer isn't happy with it, whatever. It's that you just can't get to economic scale quickly enough and you can't generate the cash to uh, keep the business alive. 
I'm about to wrap up the, the hour, but uh, two final questions I'll ask at the same time is, one, what would you advise your 25 or 30, 30 year old self based on your experience you have today? And also you've given us so much knowledge, what can the Zoogler community do to be helpful to you, Dan? Um, well, the first one, probably go back to what we talked about earlier, which is uh, have a view on which areas are gonna be more important to the future than they are to the past, whether that's LLM or biotech or, or uh, quantum computing or whatever. And if you have the capabilities and the interest, so if you can tick those other three buckets, I'm gonna be learning, I'm gonna be having fun and I'm gonna be adding value in one of those spaces, go there because that way you're gonna be in a, uh, in a successful future. Um, and you know, I mean, this, this community has been incredibly kind and generous to me you know, throughout my time at Google and beyond. And uh, you know, the number of people that I've connected to within Google to say, oh, do you know anybody who can help this startup? Uh, startup I'm working with is uh, you know, locked out of this particular Google system if they're still there or is, uh, is trying to figure out something with Stripe if that person has moved on from Google Stripe. I've had loads of help like that. So. Um, just continue to to be responsive there and um, and help each other. You know this great advantage of this community is that it is so rich and so strong. And uh, with your help, Chris and the others, uh, increasingly well connected. So just look for ways to help each other, and I think it will get ever stronger. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for your time, John. As well, thank you for suggesting and introducing me to Dan and everyone. Contribute to the community. If you are in a location, want to find out the Zooglers, bring it together. Um, act what uh, Dan was suggesting to do. He has this really strong Capital One network as well. And Dan, thank you for taking time right after your, your family holiday to educate all of us uh, this morning and evening, wherever everyone's joining from. I really enjoyed the chat, Chris. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. See you at the next event. Thank you.